This is the poet T.S. Eliot. In one of his verses, he once asked the following questions. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? If he had been writing today, in the age of big data, he might have been tempted to add another question. Where is the information we have lost in data? And it's interesting to consider what these four words mean and how they relate to each other. Wisdom, knowledge, information and data. These words are often arranged in a hierarchy like this. And T.S. Eliot was worried, rightly or wrongly, about things going in this direction. About understanding that we once had being lost. But people working in science and medicine, which is what I'm going to talk about, are generally trying to go in this direction. You begin with data, raw facts about the world. You turn the data into information via a process of interpretation. You turn the information into knowledge via a process of understanding. And then maybe, if you achieve an even more profound understanding, you attain wisdom. Now, there are three things you might notice about this upward trajectory. First, it takes work to move up through these stages. Second, the higher you go, the more difficult it is to automate this work. We have artificial intelligence technologies that can be very helpful in gathering data and perhaps also in interpreting data. But it's debatable whether artificial intelligence could ever be said to be knowledgeable, much less wise. The third thing to notice is that the higher you go, the more scope there is for disagreement. As long as some basic assumptions are in place, we can agree that certain data exists. But there can be different ways of interpreting this data, which lead to different understandings. And by the time we get to wisdom, at the top of our hierarchy, we've gone well beyond science and medicine, and we start bringing in much wider considerations, which are important, but they're not the main focus of this talk. So I'll set them aside for now. I want to talk about how we get from data to knowledge using a specific example from my work. I work at the Progress Educational Trust which is a charity that improves choices for people affected by genetic conditions and infertility. One of the things we work on is a more comprehensive version of the discipline of genetics, known as genomics. And I want to talk about how we get from genomic data to genomic knowledge. So, what is genomics? Let me walk you through it. Genomics is the study and use of genomes. A genome is a complete set of DNA, or a complete set of data representing DNA. And here is an illustration of part of a DNA molecule with its famous double helix structure. A structure that was discovered 70 years ago by a remarkable group of scientists. Francis Crick. James Watson, Rosalind Franklin, Raymond Gosling, Alex Stokes, Morris Wilkins, and Herbert Wilson. It's via this DNA molecule that people inherit aspects of their biology from their parents and transmit aspects of their biology to their children. A whole genome sequence is a series of letters representing all of the chemical units in a genome. The whole genome sequence of a human individual consists of a series of more than six billion letters. And most of the cells in the individual's body will contain DNA with this same sequence. The whole genome sequence of an individual is unique to that individual, unless they have an identical twin, in which case the twins will have the same whole genome sequence, or almost the same whole genome sequence. There are phenomena that can lead to minute differences. Now, it's only relatively recently that it's become possible to sequence the whole genome 
of a human. Here is a symbolic depiction of the USA and the UK knitting the world's first human whole genome sequence out of DNA. 20 years ago, the Human Genome Project achieved the first near-complete whole genome sequence of a human. And then last year, the Telomere to Telomere Consortium succeeded in filling in the gaps, the parts of the human genome that were too difficult to sequence with the technology that was available 20 years ago. So if you want to understand what's been going on with human whole genome sequencing over the past 20 years, the three key trends have been these. The proportion of the human genome that it's possible to sequence has gone up. The time it takes to sequence a human genome has gone down from years to days, if not hours. And the cost of sequencing a human genome has also gone down from literally billions of dollars per whole genome sequence to thousands of dollars or less. Although we should be careful to observe that everything I've just said refers only to the gathering of the genomic data. Interpreting this data, turning it into information and then knowledge, still requires added time, expense and expertise. So while genomics has enormous potential in the field of healthcare, realising this potential is still challenging, especially when you consider that the relationship between genomics, disease and disease treatment is often not straightforward. This relationship can be complicated by many factors, just a few of which are listed here. I won't go through what these terms mean. The important thing to understand is that they're examples of the many things that can complicate a simple story of sequence genome, find cause of disease, treat disease. And then on top of these complications, there's also the fact that there are many aspects of genomes we still don't fully understand, which is why we need to conduct genomic research. But this then poses its own challenges. Research involves improving understanding of human health and disease in general, whereas diagnosis and treatment involve helping specific people with diseases that affect them. Now, sometimes these endeavours can overlap slightly, which makes sense because it's by studying what happens when people are affected by disease that we figure out how to help them and also gain a better understanding of how biology works in all the people who don't have the disease. But when it comes to big projects that involve sequencing human genomes, there can be a much larger overlap between research on the one hand and diagnosis and treatment on the other hand. This overlap can have benefits, but it also poses difficulties because the same genomic data has to be turned into information and then knowledge in quite different ways in these two contexts. For example, anything discovered in a person's genome is potentially of interest to researchers. But on the diagnosis and treatment side, one has to think very carefully before telling a patient about something discovered in their genome that's not related to the reason why they agreed to have their genome sequenced in the first place. Similarly, if I tell a researcher there's something in a genome that's ambiguous or of uncertain significance, the researcher is liable to respond by saying, isn't that interesting? But if I tell you there's something in your genome or in your child's genome that's ambiguous or of uncertain significance, that's rather more distressing and not necessarily very helpful to you. So, there are all sorts of considerations that need to be balanced here. And there are people whose job it is to think very carefully about what is done with genomic data in these different contexts. Just to make it even more complicated, sometimes there are other imperatives that come into play as well. For example, trying to transform a health system 
or to establish a global reputation for innovation. If you pursue uh, these sorts of imperatives and you succeed, then this can potentially be of great benefit to the research and also to the diagnosis and treatment. But it's important not to let these other imperatives become so overriding that you lose focus on the people you're trying to help. There's also another problem. This is our world. If you take any two random people from any two parts of the world, then the vast majority of their whole genome sequences will be very similar. But there's a small proportion of the human genome that can vary widely between different people, sometimes with consequences for their health. If genomics is to be of use to a wide variety of people, and help to treat their diseases, then the genomes we sequence and study need to represent the full range of human genomic diversity. And some of the genomic variation that can have consequences for health is related to people's ancestry. Now, as I've already mentioned, these countries play a leading role in creating the first human whole genome sequence, uh, the first near complete human whole genome sequence, that is. Now, people in parts of the world other than these have also had their genomes sequenced over the past 20 years, but the majority of these people have had ancestry from this part of the world, Europe. Whereas the place that currently has perhaps the widest genomic diversity, human genomic diversity in the world, is actually the continent where it's likely that we all have common ancestry if we look far enough back into prehistory, namely mainland Africa. But relatively few people in present day Africa have had their genomes sequenced. Now, you might think, of course, it was always going to be the wealthiest countries that sequenced genomes first, and then the rest of the world would catch up. The problem is, that hasn't been happening. Let me paint another picture for you using data from a recent paper by Dr. Shegun Fatuma of the African Computational Genomics Research Group and his colleagues. This is one of the ways you can categorise the world's population in terms of people's ancestry with corresponding genomic variation. And this is the proportion of people in each of these categories that is thought to make up the world's current population. Note that this is how it looks if you follow people's ancestry a certain way back into history, but not too far. If you were to go far enough back into history, then all of these colours here would probably turn purple. Because as I've said, on a long enough time scale, all humans probably have African ancestry. But using this particular categorisation, let's look at how many people with each type of ancestry have had their genomes sequenced over the past 20 years. As you can see, the overwhelming majority of these people are of European ancestry, with East Asia catching up a tiny bit recently and Africa still just a thin strip of purple. OK, you might think but the total number of people having their genomes sequenced is going up quite steeply. Maybe a rising tide will lift all boats. To some extent that's true, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. If we take that global population breakdown on the right and create a squashed version underneath like this, and then use that for comparison while looking at fractions of all the people who've had their genomes sequenced at various points over the past 20 years, according to ancestry, then we can see a continuing and disproportionate predominance of European ancestry in the genomes that we're sequencing. Why is this a problem? Two reasons. First, it means that people who don't have European ancestry are likely to benefit less from genomic medicine even if they have their whole genomes sequenced. Because turning their genomic data into meaningful information and their knowledge that can help them and help research is made more difficult by the situation you see here. 
The second problem is that all of us, with or without European ancestry, are missing out on the discoveries that might be made if the full range of human genomic diversity were being studied. Here is our world again. And here is just a selection of the various organisations and initiatives across the globe that are working to sequence and study a wider range of genomes than tends to be sequenced and studied at present. But these projects have their work cut out. Meanwhile, it is still an achievement that in the UK, where I work, we now have an NHS Genomic Medicine Service, a National Genomic Test Directory, and a National Genomic Research Library. And there have been a number of public projects in the UK that have involved sequencing the genomes of large numbers of people. Projects run by organisations including Genomics England, UK Biobank, and Our Future Health. In conclusion then, getting from genomic data to genomic knowledge involves many challenges, locally, nationally, and globally. It's worth people being aware of and discussing these challenges as genomes and genomics come to play a more prominent role in medicine and in healthcare. And if we're successful, then who knows? We might even put the late T.S. Eliot's mind at rest and hold on to wisdom as well. Thank you.